Hello, fifth graders, and welcome to your language arts for today. For today, you will need your copy of Little Women and paper or pencil, paper and pencil, I should say, if you are writing down answers as you go. Uh, so go ahead and get those and then come on back when you are ready. So fifth graders, before we get into talking about homework, we're still kind of continuing to work on this theme, on this objective of themes. And hopefully you're seeing that as you guys are doing your themes chart, as you have done, I should say, this is helpful to make sure that you can continue completing that themes chart and get you thinking about the themes regularly. So this is your reminder that these are, there's a lot of glare happening on this one. These are the themes that we're talking about. We're gonna be looking at societal expectations of women, importance of living a virtuous life, and the relationship between money and happiness. And again, the question here being, does having more money lead to increased happiness? So keep those in mind. Those are really what's going to be guiding your reflections as we go through these homework questions. So let's go ahead and take a look at the homework that you guys just completed yesterday. And then we'll get into today's homework as well. So number one asks, where did Amy want to go with Joe, Meg, and Lori? And the answer is to a play. It's at a theater, um, which when we hear theater, theater as we maybe think movie theater, but this would have been prior to movies. So they would have wanted to go see a play. Two, what does Amy tell Joe on page 77? That's an example of foreshadowing. She says, you'll be sorry for this, Joe March. See if you ain't. Okay, so this is her hinting that something is coming and we later see what it is, which is our answer to number three. How did Amy get back at Joe? By burning her book. Where were Joe and Lori going when Amy followed? They were going to skate. Why was Joe so penitent? Remember that word penitent, sorry for wrongdoing. So Joe was so penitent because... Her temper almost led to Amy's death, right? Or something about that that she that led to Amy falling in the ice. These are the things that she was reflecting on. And six, to which theme might this relate? This might relate to the theme, the importance of living a virtuous life, right? And we see these sort of, I mean, obviously not using our virtues doesn't always lead to these clear consequences. But in this case, we see that Joe not using virtue, it, it put her sister in grave danger. So we see that one of the reasons to be using virtue, why it's important to do that is to keep others safe, to make sure we're caring for other people. And seven, Mrs. March said that she and Joe were similar in what? Correct answer was in their anger. Joe was surprised to learn this about her mom, but she learned that they were pretty similar to one another. So going into chapter nine, um, this is going to be a chapter that kind of focuses on Meg. So number one asks, where is Meg going? Two, what delivery did Meg get? Three, who do the Moffats think that Meg loves? And this is kind of like romantic, right? Who does she like, like, or who do they think she like, likes, loves? Four, what did Meg overhear at the party? Five, how did Lori react to Meg's clothes? Six, what did Mrs. March say was her plan for her girls? Seven, to which theme might this relate? And again, remember, we're talking about these themes, okay? And eight, I ask you to create your own sentence following vocabulary sentence expectations, right? So it has to have at least six words and it has to show me that you understand the definition of the word using the word irksome. Okay, so these are going to be the questions that are guiding our reading today. Um, this chapter is titled Meg Goes to Vanity Fair. Okay, and so um, as we've talked about throughout, um, this is, you know, this book is kind of tied really closely to this book, Pilgrim's Progress. And in Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Vanity Fair is a place where there's kind of this like year long fair that happens and the things that are sold there are the things that maybe make you feel good but aren't necessarily things that are good for you so the idea of vanity fair would be like you could just go and like for examples for you right you could just go and buy all the candy that you want all the time and all the video games and you never have to do anything that maybe is good for you you just get to do the things that you want that bring you pleasure and kind of this instantaneous happiness um so this kind of gives us an idea of maybe what is coming for Meg 
in this chapter as she's moving forward, um, as she's going to Vanity Fair. It's not literal. She's not literally going to Vanity Fair. Okay, she's it's figurative. It's a it's a comparison to Pilgrim's Progress, but this idea of going to a place that is really focused on sort of instantaneous, immediate pleasure rather than necessarily things that are good for you. Okay. So with that, we're going to get into our reading for today. So of course, you want to make sure that you're following along as we go and paying attention. Maybe I've been suggesting jotting down page numbers or quick answers to questions so that when it's time to go and complete the form, you feel ready to go. Okay. So with that, chapter nine, Meg goes to Vanity Fair. I do think it was the most fortunate thing in the world that those children should have the measles just now, said Meg one April day as she stood packing the go abroad trunk in her room, surrounded by her sisters. So we learned that the children that she is a governess for are sick and don't need her right now. <clears throat> and so nice of Annie Moffat not to forget her promise. A whole fortnight of fun will be regularly splendid, replied Jo, looking like a windmill as she folded skirts with her long arms. So we actually already see the answer to number one. This is a reference back to following the party that they went to earlier. Meg shared that she was invited to go visit this friend of hers. And so we learned that she's going for a fortnight, which you hear fortnight and you guys maybe are thinking about the video game Fortnite. Um, however, Fortnite is an actual length of time. Does anyone know how, I don't know why I'm asking like you're gonna be answering, but maybe you guys know how long a Fortnite is. Anyone, it's, a, it's two weeks. So she's gonna be going for two weeks to visit this friend who had invited her. So this is our answer to number one. And such lovely weather. I'm so glad of that, added Beth, tidily sorting neck and hair ribbons in her best box, lent for the great occasion. I wish I was going to have a fine time and wear all these nice things, said Amy, with her mouth full of pins as she artistically replenished her sister's cushion. I wish you were all going, but as you can't, I shall keep my adventures to tell you when I come back. I'm sure it's the least I can do when you have been so kind, lending me things and helping me get ready, said Meg, glancing round the room at the very simple outfit, which seemed nearly perfect in her eyes. And so at this point in time, Meg is looking at all of the things that she's bringing with her. And it, we're told that it's simple, but it seems very perfect to her in her eyes. And I'm bringing this up because I want you to pay attention as we go through the chapter. If those simple things of hers continue to seem really perfect in her eyes as she goes. What did mother give you out of the treasure box? Asked Amy, who had not been present at the opening of a certain cedar chest in which Mrs. March kept a few relics of past splendor as gifts for her girls when the proper time came. A pair of silk stockings, that pretty carved fan, and a lovely blue sash. I wanted the violet silk, but there isn't time to make it over so I must be contented with my old tarlatan. So we see that Meg wants to bring a silk dress, but the footnote tells us that she has this sort of cotton, a thin cotton dress instead that she's bringing with her. It will look nice over my new muslin skirt and the sash will set it off beautifully. I wish I hadn't smashed my coral bracelet for you might've had it, said Jo, who loved to give and lend, but whose possessions were usually too dilapidated to be of much use. I find this to be a very Joe moment, right? She loves to share her possessions with other people, but people don't necessarily want to borrow her possessions because they're usually kind of damaged, right? So thanks, but I'd rather not wear your damaged clothing. There is a lovely old fashioned pearl set in the treasure box, but mother said real flowers were the prettiest ornament for a young girl. And Lori promised to send me all I want, replied Meg. Now let me see. There's my new gray walking suit. Just curl up the feather in my hat. Beth, then my poplin for Sunday and, a, and the small party. It looks heavy for spring, doesn't it? The violet silk would be so nice. Oh dear. Never mind. You've got the tarlatan for the big party and you always look like an angel in white, said Amy, brooding over the little store of finery in which her soul delighted. It isn't low-necked and it doesn't sweep enough, but it will have to do. My blue house dress looks so well turned and freshly trimmed that I feel as if I'd got a new one. 
My silk sack isn't a bit the fashion, and my bonnet doesn't look like Sally's. I didn't like to say anything, but I was sadly disappointed in my umbrella. I told Mother black with a white handle, but she forgot and bought a green one with a yellowish handle. It's strong and neat, so I ought not to complain, but I know I shall feel ashamed of it beside Annie's silk one with a gold top, sighed Meg, surveying the little umbrella with great disfavor. Change it, advised Joe. So Joe's telling her, go, go exchange it for the one you wanted. I won't be so silly or hurt Marmy's feelings when she took so much pains to get my things. It's a nonsensical notion of mine, and I'm not going to give up to it. My silk stockings and two pairs of new gloves are my comfort. You are a dear to lend me yours, Joe. I feel so rich and sort of elegant with two new pairs, and the old ones cleaned up for common, and Meg took a refreshing peep at her glove box. So you see Meg is kind of trying to be grateful for what she does have rather than <clears throat> bothered by what she doesn't have. Um, but it's it's difficult for her, right? She, she has some longing for things that she wishes she had. Annie Moffat has, a blue, has blue and pink bows on her nightcaps. Would you put some on mine, she asked, as Beth brought up a pile of snowy muslins fresh from Hannah's hands. No, I wouldn't, for the smart caps won't match the plain gowns without any trimming on them. Poor folks shouldn't rig, said Joe decidedly. And so the footnote tells us dress up beyond their station. So Meg's kind of trying to make her sleeping bonnet look nicer. And Joe's saying, but that would look silly next to a very plain and simple nightgown. So she's like, you shouldn't try. Just just be who you are, right? I wonder if I shall ever be happy enough to have real lace on my clothes and bows on my cap, said Meg impatiently. You said the other day that you'd be perfectly happy if you could only go to Annie Moffat's, observed Beth in her quiet way. So I did. Well, I am happy and I won't fret, but it does seem as if the more one gets, the more one wants, doesn't it? I find that to be an interesting reflection as we think about this theme, fifth graders, right? This idea of we think that getting more is going to make us happier, but Meg's kind of reflecting that maybe that's not true. Maybe the more you get, the more you just end up wanting. There now. I have a tough time turning the page. There now. The trays are ready and everything in but my ball dress, which I shall leave for Mother to pack, said Meg, cheering up as she glanced from the half-filled trunk to the many times pressed and mended white tarlatan, which she called her ball dress with an important air. The next day was fine, and Meg departed in style for a fortnight of novelty and pleasure. Mrs. March had consented to the visit rather reluctantly, fearing that Margaret would come back more discontented than she went. But she, Meg, had begged so hard, and Sally had promised to take good care of her, and a little pleasure seemed so delightful after a winter of irksome work that the mother yielded and the daughter went to take her first taste of fashionable life. So we see that Mrs. March agrees, but there's some reluctance. She's not really feeling great about it because she's worried that for Meg to go spend a lot of time with a family who has everything they could ever dream of, it's going to make Meg feel even more discontented or unhappy about what she has here. But in the end, Marmy agrees. The Moffats were very fashionable, and Simple Meg was rather daunted at first by the splendor of the house and the elegance of its occupants. But they were kindly people in spite of the frivolous life they led, and soon put their guest at her ease. Perhaps Meg felt, without understanding why, that they were not particularly cultivated or intelligent people, and that all their gilding could not quite conceal the ordinary material of which they were made. So Meg's kind of realizing maybe even though they have a lot of money, maybe they're not actually all that different or special, right? They're just regular people who happen to have a lot of money. It certainly was agreeable to fare sumptuously, so to eat well, drive in a fine carriage, wear her best frock every day, and do nothing but enjoy herself. It suited her exactly, and soon she began to imitate the manners and conversation of those about her to put on her little airs and graces, use French phrases, crimp her hair, take in her dresses, and talk about the fashions as well as she could. The more she saw of Annie Moffat's pretty things, the more she envied her and sighed to be rich. Home now looked bare and dismal as she thought of it. Work grew harder than ever, and she felt that she was a very destitute and much injured girl. 
in spite of the new gloves and silk stockings. So it seems that Marmy's worries have come true, that Meg is starting to become more and more discontented with her own life. She's kind of acting more like the Moffats and a little bit less happy about what she has. She had not much time for repining, however, for the three young girls were busily employed and having a good time. They shopped, walked, rode, and called all day, went to theaters and operas, or frolicked at home in the evening, for Annie had many friends and knew how to entertain them. Her older sisters were very fine young ladies, and one was engaged, which was extremely interesting and romantic, Meg thought. Mr. Moffat was a fat, jolly old gentleman who knew her father, and Mrs. Moffat a fat, jolly old lady who took as great a fancy to Meg as her daughter had done. Everyone petted her, and Daisy, as they called her, was in a fair way to have her head turned. So everyone likes Meg, and they're treating her really, really nicely and taking care of her, and they also call her Daisy. When the evening for the small party came, she found that the poplin wouldn't do at all, for the other girls were putting on thin dresses and making themselves very fine indeed. So out came the tarlatan, looking older, limper, and shabbier than ever beside Sally's crisp new one. Meg saw the girls glance at it and then at one another, and her cheeks began to burn, for with all her gentleness she was very proud. So Meg pulls out the dress and the girls kind of are giving that look of like, and with their eyes are like, what is she wearing? And so it's embarrassing Meg to feel like she's being judged for her clothing. No one said a word about it, but Sally offered to dress her hair and Annie to tie her sash and Belle, the engaged sister, praised her white arms. But in their kindness, Meg saw only pity for her poverty and her heart felt very heavy as she stood by herself while the others laughed, chattered and flew about like gauzy butterflies. The hard, bitter feeling was getting pretty bad when the maid brought in a box of flowers. So Meg's feeling pretty badly about herself until some flowers come. Before she could speak, Annie had the cover off and all were exclaiming at the lovely roses, heath and fern within. It's for Belle, of course. George always sends her some. But these are altogether ravishing, cried Annie with a great sniff. They are for Miss March, the man said. <clears throat> and here's a note, put in the maid holding it to Meg. What fun, who are they from? Didn't know you had a lover, cried the girls, fluttering about Meg in a high state of curiosity and surprise. So they assume that Meg's getting flowers because somebody's, you know, courting her and interested in her romantically. The note is from Mother and the flowers from Lori, said Meg simply, yet much gratified that he had not forgotten her. Oh, indeed, said Annie with a funny look as Meg slipped the note into her pocket as a sort of talisman against envy, vanity, and false pride. For the few loving words had done her good, and the flowers cheered her up by their beauty. So we see that the girls are assuming even more, right? Oh, indeed, he sent you flowers, right? The implication is, oh, somebody's got a crush. Feeling almost happy again, she laid by a few ferns and roses for herself and quickly made up the rest in dainty bouquets for the breast hair or skirts of her friends, offering them so prettily that Clara, the elder sister, told her she was the sweetest thing she ever saw, and they looked quite charmed with her small attention. Somehow, the kind act had finished her despondency, and when all the rest went to show themselves to Mrs. Moffat, she saw a happy, bright-eyed face in the mirror as she laid her ferns against her rippling hair and fastened the roses in the dress that didn't strike her as so very shabby now. So the note from her mom and the flowers from Lori had kind of cheered her up and made her feel a little bit better. Also, that we've talked about her answer to number two at this point and number three for that matter. She enjoyed herself very much that evening for she danced to her heart's content. Everyone was very kind and she had three compliments. Annie made her sing, and someone said she had a remarkably fine voice. Major Lincoln asked who the fresh little girl with the beautiful eyes was, and Mr. Moffat insisted on dancing with her because she didn't dawdle, but had some spring in her, as he gracefully expressed it. So altogether, she had a very nice time, till she overheard a bit of conversation which disturbed her extremely. So we're going to be looking at question four here. And it's going to require us to do a little bit of inferring, okay? We're not going to totally know what's being described, but we should be able to reason our way through it. She was sitting just inside the conservatory, waiting for her partner to bring her an ice. 
when she heard a voice ask on the other side of the flowery wall. How old is he? Sixteen or seventeen, I should say, replied another voice. It would be a grand thing for one of those girls, wouldn't it? Sally says they are very intimate now, and the old man quite dotes on them. So we kind of have to start thinking about this. They're talking about some people. Those girls, who would those girls be in this story? Who would those girls be? So I'm thinking the marches, right? Presumably when we're talking about a family of girls, it's the marches. And they're talking about how they're very intimate, very close with a he who's about 16 or 17. So who are the March girls really close with? Who is he's 16 or 17? Another hint would be the old man is a part of it too. So there's a 16 or 17 year old boy and then an old man. Yeah, that's thinking about the Lawrences, right? Lori would be the boy and the old man would be Mr. Lawrence. And so they're saying it, something, would be really great for one of the March girls, wouldn't it? Okay. Mrs. M, that's Marmy. Mrs. M has made her plans, I dare say, and will play her cards well, early as it is. So they're implying that Mrs. March has planned for something that would be a grand thing for one of the Marches. The girl, Meg, evidently doesn't think of it yet, said Mrs. Moffat. She told that fib about her mama as if she did know and colored up when the flowers came quite prettily. Poor thing, she'd be so nice if she was only got up in style. Do you think she'd be offended if we offered to lend her a dress for Thursday? Asked another voice. She's proud, but I don't believe she'd mind, for that dowdy tarlatan is all she has got. She may tear it tonight, and that will be a good excuse for offering a decent one. We'll see. I shall ask young Lawrence as a compliment to her, and we'll have fun about it afterward. Okay, so this kind of connects to this earlier question that the Moffats are assuming that there's like a love interest between Meg and Lori. Um... Okay, and then there's this whole thing about Mrs. March having made her plans. And so the question is kind of what is she, what are they implying that Mrs. March has planned to do that involves Lori and one of her daughters that would be a grand thing for the family, for one of the girls? What would be grand? So it's kind of tricky, but they're kind of hinting at the fact that maybe Marmy has tried to set it up so that she gets one of her daughters to marry Lori. And why would that be good for the Marches? Why would that be good for them in sort of like a, a worldly sense? I mean, this idea that the, the Lawrences have a lot of money. And so if one of the daughters married, what would that do for them? There'd be a lot of money. And so the implication is that Marmy's trying to get plans to have one of her daughters marry Lori so that their family can have a lot of money. Does that sound like what we know about Marmy? I think Marmy's the one who keeps kind of telling him, I'd rather you marry somebody who is good and kind and patient. That's more important to me than you being married for money, right? So there's this kind of strange conversation happening about that. That helped not at all. i got to figure out what I'm going to do about this glare, fifth graders, because it is intense. <laughs> okay, so this implication, right, which seems not like Marmy, but yet here Meg is thinking about this idea that her mom's setting her up to be married for money. Interesting. <sighs> okay. And then they kind of make fun of her dress and they, they sort of laugh and say like, oh, maybe she'll rip her dress and then she'll have to borrow a new one. Here Meg's partner appeared to find her looking much flushed and rather agitated. She was proud and her pride was useful just then for it helped her to hide her mortification, anger, and disgust at what she had just heard. For innocent and unsuspicious as she was, she could not help understanding the gossip of her friends. She tried to forget it, but she could not and kept repeating to herself, Mrs. M has made her plans, that fib about her mama and dowdy tarlatan, till she was ready to cry and rush home to tell her troubles and ask for advice. 
if you've ever heard, overheard people saying mean things about you, then you can maybe you've had that experience of the words just kind of going over and over and over in your head and you can't forget them. As that was impossible, she did her best to seem gay and <clears throat> being rather excited, she succeeded so well that no one dreamed what an effort she was making. She was very glad when it was all over and she was quiet in her bed where she could think and wonder and fume till her head ached and her hot cheeks were cooled by a few natural tears. Those foolish yet well-meant words had opened a new world to Meg and much disturbed the peace of the old one in which till now she had lived as happily as a child. Her innocent friendship with Lori was spoiled by the silly speeches she had overheard. Her faith in her mother was a little shaken by the worldly plans attributed to her by Mrs. Moffat, who judged others by herself, and the sensible resolution to be contented with the simple wardrobe which suited a poor man's daughter was weakened by the unnecessary pity of girls who thought a shabby dress one of the greatest calamities under heaven. Now, it's kind of been messing with Meg's head a little bit, and she's having a tough time, um, I don't know, feeling like she understands things clearly. Poor Meg had a restless night and got up heavy-eyed, unhappy, half resentful toward her friends, and half ashamed of herself for not speaking out frankly and setting everything right. Everybody dawdled that morning, and it was noon before the girls found energy enough even to take up their worsted work. Something in the manner of her, friend, of her friends struck Meg at once. They treated her with more respect, she thought, took quite a tender interest in what she said, and looked at her with eyes that plainly betrayed curiosity. All this surprised and flattered her, though she did not understand it till Miss Bell looked up from her writing and said with a sentimental air. So remember, sentimental is sort of like romantic, right? Sighing and romantic. Daisy, dear, I've sent an invitation to your friend, Mr. Lawrence, for Thursday. We should like to know him. And it's only proper to compliment you. Only a proper compliment to you. So Meg's kind of wondering, like, what's the deal? Why are they all treating me differently? And then she realizes that they're starting to, like, treat her because they think that she might marry Lori and then become wealthier. And there's the interesting thing about it. But Belle tells her. We've invited him to come over for, um, to come to the next party. So Meg colored, she blushed, but a mischievous fancy to tease the girls made her reply demurely. You are very kind, but I'm afraid he won't come. Why not, Cherie? asked Miss Bell. He's too old. My child, what do you mean? What is his age, I beg to know, cried Miss Clara. Nearly 70, I believe, answered Meg, counting stitches to hide the merriment in her eyes. You sly creature, of course we meant the young man, exclaimed Miss Bell, laughing. So Meg just decides to tease them. They said, we invited Mr. Lawrence, and Meg knows they mean Lori. But she thinks, you know what, I'm not a big fan of the way you're treating me right now, so I'm going to tease you back, and says, oh, he's too old to come, and kind of pretends that she thinks they're talking about Mr. Lawrence. There isn't any young man. Lori is only a little boy. And Meg laughed also at the queer look which the sisters exchanged as she thus described her supposed lover. About your age, Nan said. Nearer my sister, Joe's. I am 17 in August, returned Meg, tossing her head. It's very nice of him to send you flowers, isn't it? Said Annie, looking wise about nothing, so Annie doesn't get what's going on. Yes, he often does to all of us, for their house is full and we are so fond of them. My mother and old Mr. Lawrence are friends, you know, so it is quite natural that we children should play together. And Meg hoped they wouldn't say, they would say no more. It's evident Daisy isn't out yet, said Miss Clara to Belle with a nod. Quite a pastoral state of innocence all around, returned Miss Bell with a shrug. So they're saying that Meg isn't out, which means, remember, we kind of talked about this earlier, that at this time, if a person, if a young girl was declared out, it meant that they were available for marriage and that men would come and court them and try to convince them to marry them. So they're saying, clearly, she's not out yet. And they're kind of saying, oh, how cute. She's so innocent and young. And they're not really being very nice, even though they're not, like, saying something outwardly mean. I'm going out to get some little matters for my girls. Can I do anything for you, young ladies? Asked Mrs. Moffat, lumbering in like an elephant in silk and lace. 
No, thank you, ma'am, replied Sally. I've got my new pink silk for Thursday and don't want a thing. Nor I, began Meg, but stopped because it occurred to her that she did want several things and could not have them. What shall you wear, asked Sally. My old white one again, if I can mend it fit to be seen. It got sadly torn last night, said Meg, trying to speak quite easily, but feeling very uncomfortable. Why don't you send home for another, said Sally, who was not an observing young lady. I haven't got any other. It cost Meg an effort to say that, but Sally did not see it and exclaimed in amiable surprise. Only that? How funny! She did not finish her speech, for Belle shook her head at her and broke in, saying kindly, Not at all. Where is the use of having a lot of dresses when she isn't out? There's no need of sending home, Daisy, even if you had a dozen, for I've got a sweet blue silk laid away, which I've outgrown, and you shall wear it to please me, won't you, my dear? You are very kind, but I don't mind my old dress if you don't. It does well enough for a little girl like me, said Meg. Now do let me please myself by dressing you up in style. I admire to do it, and you'd be a regular little beauty with a touch here and there. I shan't let anyone see you till you are done, and then we'll burst upon them like Cinderella and her godmother going to the ball, said Belle in her persuasive tone. Meg couldn't refuse the offer so kindly made, for a desire to see if she would be a little beauty after touching up caused her to accept and forget all her former uncomfortable feelings toward the Moffats. So in the end, it seems like the Moffats are kind of getting their wish, right, that Meg's dress was torn, and so they're hoping to kind of dress her up or give her a makeover, and it's almost like they see her like a doll that they can play as dress up, and Meg eventually says, okay, fine, I agree, okay? On the Thursday evening, Belle shut herself up with her maid, and between them, they turned Meg into a fine lady. They crimped and curled her hair, they polished her neck and arms with some fragrant powder, touched her lips with coralline salve to make them redder, and Hortense would have added a soukhan of rouge if Meg had not rebelled. They laced her into a sky-blue dress, which was so tight she could hardly breathe, and so low in the neck that modest Meg blushed in the mirror. A set of silver filigree was added, bracelets, necklace, brooch, and even earrings, for Hortense tied them on with a bit of pink silk which did not show. A cluster of tea rosebuds at the bosom and a ruche reconciled Meg to the display of her pretty white shoulders, and a pair of high-heeled blue silk boots satisfied the last wish of her heart. A lace handkerchief, a plumy fan, and a bouquet in a silver holder finished her off, and Miss Bell surveyed her with the satisfaction of a little girl with a newly dressed doll. There we go, the doll thing. Mademoiselle is charmant très jolie, is she not? cried Hortense, clapping her hands in an affected rapture. The footnote tells us that that means charming, very pretty. Come and show yourself, said Miss Bell, leading the way to the room where the others were waiting. As Meg went rustling after with her long skirts trailing, her earrings tinkling, her curls waving, and her heart beating, she felt as if her fun had really begun at last, for the mirror had plainly told her that she was a little beauty. Her friends repeated the pleasing phrase enthusiastically, and for several minutes she stood like the jackdaw in the fable, enjoying her borrowed plumes while the rest chattered like a party of magpies. So we see that Meg is very delighted with what she sees. It's just kind of looking in the mirror and feeling pretty good about the way she's looking. While I dress, do you drill her, Nan, in the management of her skirt and those French heels or she will trip herself up. Take your silver butterfly and catch up that long curl on the left side of her head, Clara, and don't any of you disturb the charming work of my hands, said Belle, as she hurried away, looking well pleased with her success. I'm afraid to go down. I feel so queer and stiff and half-dressed, said Meg to Sally as the bell rang, and Mrs. Moffat sent to ask the young ladies to appear at once. You don't look a bit like yourself, but you are very nice. I'm nowhere beside you, for Belle has heaps of taste, and you're quite French, I assure you. Let your flowers hang. Don't be so careful of them, and be sure you don't trip, returned Sally, trying not to care that Meg was prettier than herself. Keeping that warning carefully in mind, Margaret got safely downstairs and sailed into the drawing rooms where the Moffats and a few early guests were assembled. 
She very soon discovered that there is a charm about fine clothes which attracts a certain class of people and secures their respect. Several young ladies who had taken no notice of her before were very affectionate all of a sudden. Several young gentlemen who had only stared at her the, at the other party now not only stared but asked to be introduced and said all manner of foolish but agreeable things to her. And several old ladies who sat on sofas and criticized the rest of the party inquired who she was with an air of interest. So all of a sudden, everybody's very interested in Meg because her clothing is different and, and fancier. She heard Mrs. Moffat reply to one of them. Daisy March, father, a colonel in the army, one of, four, one of our first families, but reverses of fortune, you know. Intimate friends of the Lawrences, sweet creature, I assure you. My Ned is quite wild about her. Dear me, said the old lady, putting up her glass for another observation of Meg, who tried to look as if she had not heard, and been rather shocked at Mrs. Moffat's fibs. So the things that Mrs. Moffat is saying are not exactly true. The queer feeling did not pass away, but she imagined herself acting the new part of fine lady and so got on pretty well, though the tight dress gave her a side ache. The train kept on getting under her feet, and she was in constant fear lest her earrings should fly off and get lost or broken. She was flirting her fan and laughing at the feeble jokes of a young gentleman who tried to be witty when she suddenly stopped laughing and looked confused. For just opposite, she saw Lori. He was staring at her with undisguised surprise, which means Lori sees her and is just shocked and isn't really trying to hide it. And disapproval also, so he doesn't really like it. She thought, for though he bowed and smiled, yet something in his honest eyes made her blush and wish she had her old dress on. To complete her confusion, she saw Belle nudge Annie and both glance from her to Lori, who she was happy to see looked unusually boyish and, and shy. So as he comes in and they're looking at each other, the girls are kind of like, look at, look at, look at, silly creatures to put such thoughts into my head. I won't care for it or let it change me a bit, thought Meg and rustled across the room to shake hands with her friend. I'm glad you came. I was afraid you wouldn't, she said with her most grown-up air. Joe wanted me to come and tell her how you looked, so I did, answered Lori, without turning his eyes upon her, though he half smiled at her maternal tone. What shall you tell her, asked Meg, full of curiosity to know his opinion of her, yet feeling ill at ease with him for the first time. I shall say I didn't know you, for you look so grown up and unlike yourself. I'm quite afraid of you, he said, fumbling at his glove button. How absurd of you. The girls dressed me up for fun, and I rather like it. Wouldn't Joe stare if she saw me, said Meg, bent on making him say whether he thought her improved or not. Yes, I think she would, returned Lori gravely. Don't you like me so, asked Meg. No, I don't was the blunt reply. <gasps> Why not? In an anxious tone. He glanced at her frizzled head, bare shoulders, and fantastically trimmed dress with an expression that abashed her more than his answer. So the look on his face is making her feel really embarrassed, <laughs> which not had not a particle of his unusual politeness about it. I don't like fuss and feathers. That was altogether too much from a lad younger than herself, and Meg walked away, saying petulantly, you are the rudest boy I ever saw. Feeling very much ruffled, she went and stood at the quiet window and to cool her cheeks, for the tight dress gave her an uncomfortably brilliant color. As she stood there, Major Lincoln passed by, and a minute after, she heard him saying to his mother, they are making a fool of that little girl. I wanted you to see her, but they have spoiled her entirely. She's nothing but a doll tonight. Oh, dear, sighed Meg. I wish I'd been sensible and worn my own things. Then I should not have disgusted other people or felt so uncomfortable and ashamed of myself. She leaned her forehead on the cool pane and stood half hidden by the curtains, never minding that her favorite waltz had begun. Till someone touched her and turning, she saw Lori looking penitent. There's that word again. So sorry. He feels badly about how he talked to her. As he said, with his very best bow and his hand out, Please forgive my rudeness and come and dance with me. I'm afraid it will be too disagreeable to you, said Meg, trying to look offended, but failing entirely. 
Not a bit of it. I'm dying to do it. Come, I'll be good. I don't like your gown, but I do think that you are just splendid. And he waved his hands as if words failed to express his admiration. Meg smiled and relented and whispered as they stood waiting to catch the time. Take care my skirt doesn't trip you up. It's the plague of my life and I was a goose to wear it. Pin it round your neck and then it will be useful, said Laurie, looking down at the little blue boots, which he evidently approved of. So Laurie's talking about covering up everything else at the bottom of the dress, but he likes her boots. Away they went fleetly and gracefully, for having practiced at home, they were well matched, and the blithe young couple were a pleasant sight to see as they twirled merrily round and round, feeling more friendly than ever after their small tiff. Lori, I want you to do me a favor, will you? said Meg as he stood fanning her with her when her breath gave out, which it did very soon, though she did not, would not own why. Won't I? said, Alor said Lori with alacrity. Please don't tell them at home about my dress tonight. They won't understand the joke, and it will worry Mother. Then why did you do it? said Lori's eyes, so plainly that Meg hastily added, I shall tell them myself all about it, and fess to Mother how silly I've been. But I'd rather do it myself, so you'll not tell, will you? I give you my word I won't. Only, what shall I say when they ask me? Just say that I looked pretty, pretty well and was having a good time. I'll say the first with all my heart, but how about the other? You don't look as if you were having a good time, are you? And Lori looked at her with an expression which made her answer in a whisper. No, not just now. Don't think I'm horrid. I only wanted a little fun, but this sort doesn't pay, I find, and I'm getting tired of it. Here comes Ned Moffat. What does he want, said Lori, knitting his black brows, as if he did not regard his young host in the light of a pleasant addition to the party. He put his name down for three dances, and I suppose he's coming for them. What a bore, said Meg, assuming a languid air which amused Lori immensely. He did not speak to her again till supper time, when he saw her drinking champagne with Ned and his friend Fisher, who were behaving like a pair of fools, as Lori said to himself, for he felt a brotherly sort of right to watch over the marches and fight their battles whenever a defender was needed. You'll have a splitting headache tomorrow if you drink much of that. I wouldn't, Meg. Your mother doesn't like it, you know, he whispered, leaning over her chair as Ned turned to refill her glass and Fisher stooped to pick up her fan. I'm not Meg tonight. I'm a doll who does all sorts of crazy things. Tomorrow I shall put away my fuss and feathers and be desperately good again, she answered with an affected little laugh. Wish tomorrow was here then, muttered Laurie, walking off, ill-pleased at the change he saw in her. Meg danced and flirted, chattered and giggled as the other girls did. After, a, after supper, she undertook the German, which the footnote tells us is a, a dance and blundered through it, nearly upsetting her partner with her long skirt and romping in a way that scandalized Laurie, who looked on and meditated a lecture. But he got no chance to deliver it, for Meg kept away from him till he came to say good night. Remember, she said, trying to smile, for the splitting headache had already begun. Silence à la mort, replied Laurie, with a melodramatic flourish as he went away. Silence to the death, he said, so he's not, he's going to keep her secret. This little bit of byplay excited Annie's curiosity, so all of a sudden Annie's wondering, what is the secret they're keeping? But Meg was too tired for gossip and went to bed, feeling as if she had been to a masquerade and hadn't enjoyed herself as much as she expected. She was sick all the next day and on Saturday went home, quite used up with her fortnight's fun and feeling that she had sat in the lap of luxury long enough. It does seem pleasant to be quiet and not have company manners on all the time. Home is a nice place, though it isn't splendid, said Meg, looking about her with a restful expression as she sat with her mother and Joe on the Sunday evening. So Meg's kind of reflecting on she had this chance for two weeks to live as if she could have anything she wanted, all the money in the world. And at the end, she's starting to feel like, oh, it didn't really make me as happy as I thought it would. And so this maybe could relate to that theme about um, the relationship between money and happiness, right? There's this thought there. I'm glad to hear you say so, dear, for I was afraid home would seem dull and poor to you after your fine quarters, replied her mother, who had given her many anxious looks that day. Her motherly eyes are quick to see any change in children's faces. Meg had told her, 
adventures gaily and said over and over what a charming time she had had. But something still seemed to weigh upon her spirits. And when the younger girl girls were gone to bed, she sat thoughtfully staring at the fire, saying little and looking worried. As the clock struck nine and Joe proposed bed, Meg suddenly left her chair and, taking Beth's stool, leaned her elbows on her mother's knee, saying bravely, Marmy, I want to fess. So fess meaning short for confess or say what she did. I thought so. What is it, dear? Shall I go away? asked Joe discreetly. Of course not. Don't I always tell you everything? I was ashamed to speak of it before the children, but I want you to know all the dreadful things I did at the Moffats. We are prepared, said Mrs. March, smiling, but looking a little anxious. I told you they dressed me up, but I didn't tell you that they powdered and squeezed and frizzled and make me look like a fashion plate. Lori thought I wasn't proper. I know he did, though he didn't say so, and one man called me a doll. I knew it was silly, but they flattered me and said I was a beauty and quantities of nonsense, so I let them make a fool of me. Is that all? asked Joe, as Mrs. March looked silently at the downcast face of her pretty daughter and could not find it in her heart to blame her little follies. No, I drank champagne and romped and tried to flirt and was altogether abominable, said Meg self-reproachfully. There is something more, I think. And Mrs. March smoothed the soft cheek, which suddenly grew rosy as Meg answered slowly. Yes, it's very silly, but I want to tell it because I hate to have people say and think such things about us and Lori. Then she told the various bits of gossip she had heard at the Moffats. And as she spoke, Joe saw her mother fold her lips tightly. Remember, that's the sign that Marmy is very angry. As if ill-pleased that such ideas should be put into Meg's innocent mind. Well, if that isn't the greatest rubbish I ever heard, cried Joe indignantly, why didn't you pop out and tell them that on the spot? couldn't. It was so embarrassing for me. I couldn't help hearing at first, and then I was so angry and ashamed I didn't remember that I ought to go away. So the part that she's telling, in case you're forgetting, is the part where she overheard people implying that the Marches were trying to get any one of the daughters to marry Lori for his money, okay? So she's repeating that part back. Just wait till I see Annie Moffat, and I'll show you how to settle such ridiculous stuff. The idea of having plans and being kind to Lori because he's rich and may marry us by and by. Won't he shout when I tell him what those silly things say people say about us poor children? And Joe laughed as if on second thoughts the thing struck her as a good joke. If you tell Lori, I'll never forgive you. She mustn't, must she, mother, said Meg, looking distressed. No, never repeat that foolish gossip and forget it as soon as you can, said Mrs. March gravely. I was very unwise to let you go among people of whom I know so little. Kind, I dare say, but worldly, ill-bred, and full of these vulgar ideas about young people. I am more sorry than I can express for the mischief this visit may have done you, Meg. Don't be sorry. I won't let it hurt me. I'll forget all the bad and remember only the good, for I did enjoy a great deal. And thank you very much for letting me go. I'll not be sentimental or dissatisfied, Mother. I know I'm a silly little girl, and I'll stay with you till I'm fit to take care of myself. But it is nice to be praised and admired, and I can't help saying I like it, said Meg, looking half ashamed of the confession. That is perfectly natural and quite harmless if the liking does not become a passion and lead one to do foolish or unmaidenly things. Learn to know the value, the praise which is worth having, and to excite the admi admiration of excellent people by being modest as well as pretty, Meg. Margaret sat thinking a moment while Joe stood with her hands behind her, looking both interested and a little perplexed, for it was a new thing to see Meg blushing and talking about admiration, lovers, and things of that sort. And Joe felt as if during that fortnight her sister had grown up amazingly and was drifting away from her into a world where she could not follow. Mother, do you have plans, as Miss Moffat said, asked Meg bashfully. Yes, my dear, I have a great many. So fifth grade, this is getting on to our next question, question seven, I think. I have a great many, she says. All mothers do. But mine differ somewhat from Mrs. Moffat's. This is six, sorry, I suspect. I will tell you some of them, for the time has come when a word may set this romantic little head and heart of yours right on a very serious subject. 
You are young, Meg, but not too young to understand me, and mother's lips are the fittest to speak of such things to girls like you. Joe, your turn will come in time, perhaps, so listen to my plans and help me carry them out if they are good. Joe went and sat on one arm of the chair, looking as if she thought they were about to join in some very solemn affair. Holding a hand of each and watching the two young faces wistfully, Mrs. March said in her serious yet cheery way, I want my daughters to be beautiful, accomplished, and good, to be admired, loved, and respected, to have a happy youth, to be well and wisely married, and to lead useful, pleasant lives with as little care and sorrow to try to try them as God sees fit to send. To be loved and chosen by a good man is the best and sweetest thing which can happen to a woman. And I sincerely hope my girls may know this beautiful experience. It is natural to think of it, Meg, right? To hope and wait for it and wise to prepare for it. So that when the happy time comes, you may feel ready for the duties and worthy of the joy. My dear girls, I am ambitious for you, but not to have you make a dash in the world. Marry rich men merely because they are rich or have splendid houses, which are not homes because love is wanting. Money is a needful and precious thing, and when well used, a noble thing. But I never want you to think it's the first or only prize to strive for. I'd rather see you poor men's wives if you were happy, beloved, and contented than queens on thrones without self-respect and peace. So this last part is really getting at what she's talking about. And Mrs. March admits, like, it's good to have money. It's worthwhile to have money. You need to have money. But it can't be the only thing. And it certainly can't replace being happy with your spouse. So she's saying, I would rather you be poor and married to someone who loves you and respects you than to have all the money in the world and not have those things. Poor girls don't stand any chance, Belle says, unless they put themselves forward, sighed Meg. Then we'll be old maids, said Joe stoutly. Right, Joe. Better be happy old maids than unhappy wives or unmaidenly girls running about to find husbands, said Mrs. March decidedly. Don't be troubled, Meg. Poverty seldom daunts a sincere lover. Sometimes some of the best and most honored women I know were poor girls, but so loveworthy that they were not allowed to be old maids. Leave these things to time. Make this home happy so that you may be fit homes of your own if they are offered you and contented here if they are not. One thing remember my girls, mother is always ready to be your confidant, father to be your friend, and both of us to trust and hope that our daughters, whether married or single, will be the pride and comfort of our lives. We will, Marmy, we will, cried both with all their hearts as she bade them good night. So we see here that Marmy's really talking about this connection about like not just marrying for money, but marrying to be happy. And so as we're thinking about which of these themes that's going to relate to, and remember, we're supposed to be picking number seven from these. What does that seem to relate to? Okay. She also kind of encourages her daughters not to be thinking about their jobs, to be running around and finding a rich husband, right? She wants them to be happy and hopeful for a happy life, whether that means being married or not. And that either way that they can have that happiness. Okay, so fifth graders, we've kind of talked about the seven questions so far. And the eighth one is about creating that vocabulary sentence. So remember referring to your vocabulary for this assignment as you get ready to do that, okay? Uh, so good luck with your homework questions. Let me know if you have any questions working on it.